since I think 2007, yeah. alright? He is now working on the government and trying to implement continuous delivery in the public sector, sector okay? In the UK government. I hope in the end of this talk that everyone start to push Portuguese government to implement the same technique because we need it. So let's hope that's going to inspire us to push our government to uh, use these techniques. So, first of all, I would like to uh, say that I'm really happy to be here in Portugal. I left in 2006 because there was not a lot of Agile uh, stuff going on. And I'm really happy that it's starting to catch up and actually there's a big community now, so it's pretty cool. The second thing that I <coughs> would like to say is that I was born in I was born in Lady and it's pretty cool to just come back here to <laughs> come back to my hometown. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm gonna speak about continuous delivery in the UK public sector. Um, I'm gonna to start to say what is continuous delivery? how we do continuous delivery and I'm going to talk about some of the benefits. Uh, I also am going to talk about uh, the public sector in general and the, and the challenges that we have in there and then I will explain our journey uh, you know that we we've been doing the last year or so um, <coughs> implementing this. So I went to Wikipedia and I just uh, took some uh, what was the definition there and there was so continuous delivery is a pattern language used in software development, blah, 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 blah. And a pattern language is basically a method of describing uh, given uh, Christopher Alexander. So I just uh, compiled that into something that is more or less a definition, which is um, it's just a collection of good design practices to, uh, in software development to help maybe improve the uh, process of software delivery. But, and I'm not sure about the design, but it's definitely a <coughs> collection of practices that people do to, to be able to automate and improve uh, how they deliver software. Um, this is basically, so if, this is also taken from Wikipedia, and it's basically uh, how we do continuous delivery in general. So uh, the delivery team, which is composed of developers usually, um, <coughs> checks in code, it goes to the version control, it gets picked up by a build server, uh, if it fails, you get feedback straight away. If it passes, it goes to, to some automated acceptance tests. If it fails, you get feedback and so on until you get to the user acceptance tests, tests which are usually manual. So you have to have some exploratory tests anyway. And <clears throat> once that's signed off and everyone agrees that, okay, this, uh, this commit is good to go, then uh, we just push it into, uh, into a live system. So, what, some of the benefits, um, usually you can bring stuff quicker, um, so you, you gain this time to market uh, by uh, starting small, so you don't have to do a big release straight away, so you just start small um, and release more often. Um, <clears throat> then there's, uh, of course your users will be happy to get stuff easy, uh, earlier in the process. You also start to get feedback from users, and you can act on those feedbacks. Uh, so you, you have an ability to react to change much more quickly. Uh, so there's also much better efficiency uh, in terms of uh, getting releases out, because usually if you have a, a massive release, and it's going to take a, a, a big amount of time, and people, it will fail in some of the, in some of the environments and stuff like that. So and you have to go back and then fix that, go through all the environments, go back. So it's, it really drains people's resources in. So if you have small releases that you automate and push straight through the pipeline, it would be, it would be much more efficient. Much more efficient. <clears throat> also, uh, in terms of reliability, I, I disagree with what was said before here that uh, if you have a, a system that um, uh, is, is uh, core to the business, let's say, um, that uh, you need to have waterfall and small, uh, big releases with massive amounts of, of uh, documentation. I've been there and it, it fails. Uh, I know that uh, having small releases is much better in terms of stability. If something goes wrong, you know exactly what went wrong. It was just that last commit that you just did. So you, you can pick up the change straight away. Um, and that means that we don't roll back ever. So if, uh, 
if something goes wrong, we can see, and uh, basically we just roll forward. We just push a, a, a new commit that fixes the problem, and it, it goes to the pipeline straight away, and and you get you get uh, get it fixed in life much quicker than if you had to roll back and then push again the same amount of stuff. <coughs> so in terms of uh, challenge in the in the public sector, of course, things that have been told here before is uh, failures and massive failures because the government is usually very big and when they fail, they fail spectacularly. And that's also security, especially in the UK, people are really, really, uh, I would say, psychotic and say too about security. And the mentality usually is uh, uh, more waterfally kind of things. So I've given some, some examples, recent examples of some failed projects. Um, so if you have a project that uh, drags itself for nine years and gets 10 billion pounds overrun, that will definitely come out in the newspapers and you know, heads will roll for sure. And so people are afraid of this, these kind of things. <coughs> So to address this, um, recently the UK uh, created a new uh, kind of sector inside the, inside the government itself called the Government D Digital Sys uh, Service. So the Government uh, Digital Services advises more or less how to do uh, projects in, uh, in, in the government. So they, they, they stopped doing uh, giving massive projects to big companies and they basically started saying we are going to go smaller companies instead. We want to deal with uh, startups or people that can deliver something from the start rather than uh, wait for two, three, nine years for something that will be cancelled in, in the end. Uh, so they started also uh, going after the free and open source so a lot of the code that we write is going to, it's going to be open sourced uh, and also they, they want to be agile they, they really want to uh, start delivering early rather than later, focus on the client because that's, that's the people that are using the, the services are usually you know, citizens and they are the ones where the systems should be done to. Uh, more, more problems uh, in terms of security is they, you, if you work in the government if, and you have data leaks, that's going to come usually on the newspaper the next day and, or if you're being hacked or something like this so um, <clears throat> this is definitely something that they don't want to happen at all uh, also they don't want uh, to, to, to realize that one of their developers actually had associations with uh, uh, terrorist, uh, terrorist uh, organizations or had bad uh, credit checks or something like this so they, 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 they want people in the, that work in the projects that needs uh, to be all cleared in terms of these things. Uh, <clears throat> so also to avoid all these kinds of things, they want restricted access to everything. All the all the systems that you try to get access to, they they're all restricted. You can't access pretty much anything. Uh, yeah, it's mostly all these things are just uh, mostly to avoid public humiliation because the tabloids in, in England are pretty pretty much uh, brutal. So what we did basically is uh, we we bring our own laptops to work. We don't we don't use any any computers given by the government. We have to use data encryption and uh, we have to lock our computers all the time with uh, with strong with strong passwords and we have to change them regularly. Uh, we had to go through clearances and background checks, uh, even though uh, some of them take almost two months to get done. Uh, we have no ac no access to any of the government system, like I said, not at all, not even via web, nothing. And there are some 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 uh, systems that we can share with the people that work there, uh, but those uh, people that put <coughs> data in it are advised not to ever put any sensitive data there. In terms of mentality, uh, <coughs> so usually people on the on the public sector. Are, very conservative. They don't. They don't like change, and they usually have this uh, documentation waterfall kind of uh, mentality. And in order to break this down, and this is really difficult, uh, we had to have GDS come in and, and advise people. 
uh, <clears throat> in order for you know to basically tell them what we want, where where the government digital systems need to, to go forward, and uh, in coach people. Uh, it takes sometimes months, lots of meetings, lots of discussions, uh, but it has to be it has to be like a, a coaching kind of way to for people to start accepting. Uh, some of these things have to be done with uh, data, so people have to be comfortable that you're not just telling something, uh, but something that actually has meaning and that is backed up by data. Uh, also, uh, we have to in ingrain in people's minds that change is now the, it's now the norm. It's not something that happens every three or six months, but it's something that con continuously happens. Uh, and yeah, of, of course, nobody wants to do cargo cult. Uh, Agile. Uh, everyone wants to be agile rather than just doing it. So <clears throat> our journey basically was replace a system that has been delivered the year before. And th this is this is quite tragic because they delivered the system that was on time and on budget, but it just didn't didn't do whatever it, it should do. So <laughs> yeah, we had to one year after we have to replace it. So uh, so this is the architecture that we used. Uh, or we use now at the moment. We have Scala, Play, and we do a microservices architecture. We have all the normal environments. Um, we started with GitLab, Pivotal, Tracking, and Jenkins. These are all the tools that are uh, not part of the government, but they are to share tools between the government uh, and us. And we, we deployed everything uh, in the GDS cloud at first. So one of the important things uh, that we needed to, to, to do in order to fix the problem which was we built a system, it was on target, it was on budget and on time but actually didn't do anything that we wanted, uh, was to prototype from the start. So prototypes were very important, people, one of our UX guys went actually to Starbucks and asked people, uh, can you use the system, uh, how does it feel like, is it intuitive? Uh, we watched them, you know, like even go through the menus and stuff like that and see if they stumble upon things and came back with that feedback and changed the, changed the prototypes and just continuously uh, did that for, for a while until we released Alpha. So at that point we just had the build server, we started doing some puppets, uh, um, automating to, to the environment, but there was only one, de one deployment to, to the Alpha uh, uh, version. Uh, from alpha till, till the beta version, we had one demo people uh, ch uh, joining us. Uh, we had some, uh, basically some monitoring, so basic, basic things like ping dom and sinsu with, with, some live, uh, with some live metrics. Uh, and then we had to go through the negotiation to release every week. Uh, for an organization that needs uh, or you sh I, we're used to releasing in three or four years time uh, having, having them went uh, from that to just one week was a, an enormous uh, negotiation uh, process but in the end we, we were able to do it and, and, the, and people are now really quite happy with it nevertheless people did not believe in us of course and uh, they, they basically said no 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 we're still gonna you know uh, take a week to have a look at the commits uh, and, and approve uh, each one of them. Uh, we want also for you to uh, request, uh, uh, request explicit, um, explicitly uh, uh, access to production. Uh, and whenever we, after all this, uh, and people were uh, trying to actually uh, do the, the, the push to production, there was a big crowd of people around that see what is he doing, what is, why is he doing that, and so, and so on, uh, like putting a lot of pressure in, in the engineers. <clears throat> so whenever, whatever we did was basically, uh, we just start doing stuff that was flawless and boring. So the people just, yeah, okay, it's just another deplo uh, deployment, it takes 10 minutes, nothing happens. I can see that the servers go up, and they go down, and then they go up with the new version. Nothing special happens. Yeah, okay. So people just stopped coming. Also, we tried to uh, speed up the approval process by uh, automating release notes. So things that came from Jira uh, and the commits, uh, we, we basically cross-check everything and they give a nice report. 
and people can uh, see the reports just before we uh, <coughs> so uh, decide which which uh, uh, releases to do. And, and so it, it usually uh, it now it, it's it's down to one day. So whenever we we decide on a release, basically after one day the release is uh, approved and we can just deploy the next day. Uh, <coughs> so more more uh, more challenges that came up afterwards, which was. Uh, so the, one of the ministers uh, came out and said, oh, we're going to deliver this project uh, by, <coughs> it's actually at the end of June. So we're going to have to be live in the end of June. Uh, um, live, I mean, to get out of beta, because we've been, we've been live for a while. It's just that has been selected users only to use the system. Uh, so, <coughs> so that means that we have been, since, uh, since September last year, we've been improving uh, live products, uh, and also every time law changes, we have to uh, cope with those. The way we did that, basically, to address the deadlines, was basically push back a lot on the, on the scope and focus on really what needed to be done until the end of this month. Uh, also, we've decided that um, we didn't want any heads to roll, so we we volunteered to do two extra weekends uh, of work, uh, but not the whole team, just one, one part of the team does one weekend, the other does the one, and uh, we, we are able to deliver what they wanted by then. So that, that was negotiated. Um, so, yeah, to, this is mostly what it is to do a continuous deployment, which is uh, you have to, when you improve, improve uh, a feature that is already live, you have to be careful uh, <clears throat> to make sure that the changes, if you have halfway commits through something, that they don't affect the product that is live already. Uh, so that's that's the concept of feature switches. So you put a, a feature switch uh, on on a piece of code, and when when the feature is complete and it's approved to go live, you just turn on the the, the switch, uh, and it just it, it's in production. Uh, <clears throat> so we have also to do. Things that happen also is when you when you are uh, you have approved the or it, it it passes all the tests automated but in UAT it fails for some reason some exploratory testing we see oh, okay but we can't go live with this we have to branch out from that commit and we have to have Jenkins uh, set up for that for those uh, cases so that uh, one of the one of these commits or one of these uh, releases has to be going through the pipeline again. Uh, in, a, in the proper way, without picking up new commits that have been pushed through the, main, the master branch. Uh, also, so, uh, things that have to be done is uh, making sure that your data migrations do not break whatever it's in there. So if you have to do some migrations on the data, you have to load the data, see if it doesn't crash, if it doesn't, uh, if it's not missing something, <coughs> or if, the, if it doesn't affect whatever it's in, in life. And he, also, we, we added a lot of uh, uh, new monitoring, uh, so to make sure that uh, we are not losing users for, for some, uh, or that they are not stuck in some point. Uh, we use Logstash and Kibana, which is uh, the free version of Splunk, basically. And uh, we have also Zabbix, which is more of a live uh, metrics. It, it has like thousands of metrics, it's pretty cool. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is for us to, to see how things vary in life. So if if we push something and it breaks the live system, we get feedback straight away that we can just do a, another uh, commit or, or push uh, to live uh, to fix the issues. So I just wanted to make some comments about feature switches because this is this is not an easy decision. Of course when we when we have these pipelines that go through and it really improves the way you do work, and it simplifies, and it makes things quick, and you get all this feedback, all these, all these uh, benefits. But dealing with feature switches is, is difficult because <coughs> even though it's quicker in, uh, compared to feature branches, uh, because you don't have any any uh, inventory of code that doesn't do any uh, anything, and it's not uh, actually being t uh, doesn't have any value. Let's say uh, it's it has to be configured per environment, and this takes some time. 
It's very intrusive. You have to actually put ifs in the code and say, if this is active, then do this. If not, uh, don't do this. Do something else. Uh, and it, it requires testing, extra testing. Make sure that when the feature is off, it works. When the feature is on, it works some, some other way. So, <clears throat> and then, when you're done with all this, you have to go back and remove all, the, all, the, all this code. Uh, and then it has to be retested. So there's a, there is a, a very big cost in terms of... Uh, but it, as you go forward, you will see that uh, this cost is, is amortized. Because uh, you're going to get better, better at it. So the backlog, the things that we have to do now is basically uh, <coughs> move into a new infrastructure. So we've been doing our stuff in the GDS and, and into in uh, IBM uh, cloud service or cloud provider. Uh, but this is not the infrastructure that uh, the government uses for, for their live systems. So we are going to have to migrate everything uh, uh, to this new but this is the great thing about doing continuous delivery, that you now have everything automated. Uh, starting service on another cloud provider or any other system it will be very, very easy. Uh, <clears throat> and also, they now know what they need, because they've seen uh, how the users interact with it, and what, how many instances they need, how, many, how, how is the architecture. Uh, defined so they can design their, their new infrastructure in a way that they are already with this amount of knowledge. Uh, and something that we also have to do is provide support. At the moment, we have so the, the government does not have enough support. Uh, uh, they don't know the apps. They, they they have to create the teams to do the, the support, and we will we will have to provide the support and, and hand over the support to the to the infrastructure to the new infrastructure. So that's pretty much it. Uh, how how we how we do um, continuous delivery in, in, uh, in the UK. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joel Herr. I'm a critical founder. I have two questions. Yeah. Sure. Right away. So the first question. Uh, if you only automate the continuous integration process, or if you also automate the, the deploy process. Okay. Yeah, it's <coughs> so. And, uh, I, I will do a okay. second question. The second question is related to the security. So you talk uh, about security issues, it's a uh, really important concern. Um, but I didn't saw that in the continuous delivery process. Usually, security testing is something that can really delay process and how do you deal with that? So for the first question is uh, yeah we do push a button takes 10 minutes and uh, so we take we take the, the builds from from Jenkins from the builds we take them uh, we test them uh, manually and then uh, it gets approved and with the push of a button we say put it live and it just goes live so that's that's automated yes uh, the second part about security um, so we still need to require uh, access to the, but the environments, these environments are not, the, we are still in our own cloud. So there's a little less uh, restrictions on security. So when, when we move to the new infrastructure, then uh, there will, it would not be us doing the, uh, there will be another team that will be responsible for picking up the builds from the, from the build server and pushing them live. And this would be, uh, I was thinking more about uh, static tests, you know, um, source code analysis for security issues, or even uh, dynamic tests like the penetration tests. Yeah, we, we do have that. In we the, do in the cycle. No, well, penetration tests they, they are they are done manually, of course. But we do have automated performance tests. Uh, we don't have any tool for static code analysis, uh, but we do we do have some uh, reviews every now and then. And uh, yeah, but the thing is, this, it, this because this is still in in beta, it's not still it's not live. There there will be a phase where the, there will be those processes will be more, I would say, more <coughs> in your face. Uh, as in, <laughs> the, yeah, they will delay a little bit more. But at the moment we are in beta. The, the securities are a little 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 bit less than 
and then they, they would be otherwise. Hi, uh, so what's preventing you to, to do a continuous deployment? So what's stopping you to actually do a command and go straight? Now? Well, actually, there's two things. Yeah, there's two things. First of all, is we don't we believe in, in exploratory testing, and so we we actually find that it's we automate as much as possible, and uh, usually uh, manual uh, usability uh, UAT is very small. It, it, it's per story, so whenever it's it's per feature, uh, but we we are, we actually want that part of the process, and when when so when when this, the, the UAT people say yeah it's good then we will push it yeah. <coughs> uh, so the other reason is of course uh, has to do with mentality. These people are still it has been one year but they are still adapting yeah. So it still takes time. I think uh, at some point they are gaining our trust uh, and I think things are improving but it's still difficult. Yeah. More questions? One more. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you use the feature switches. Yeah. Uh, how do you manage that configuration? How do you make sure that you get the right configuration to the right place? Uh, well, <coughs> so the this is this is done with Puppet, and you we have to add some configuration to the Puppet scripts. Do you use the hierarchical configuration like Yeda? Well, I, I actually. I'm not a dev the DevOps guy that read those, the written those, but we I know where to add those. I don't know exactly how they structured all the stuff. Uh, I don't know if it's hierarchical or I know that we have some configuration that has to be put in this, the puppet scripts, and they are usually turned off for some so for some environments, and usually turned off in my how many environments do you have to manage? Uh, so there's so there's dev tests. Uh, there's um, uh, preview, uh, there's performance, uh, and there's the live one at least five that I that I can. So you need to have something like. Good. Yeah, because all all of these deployments are then are then automatically. Mm -hmm. So uh, apart from the one for in production. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned right now uh, different several environments. And also in the beginning of the presentation that you have uh, my, uh, the user microservice uh, architecture. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, guarantee that uh, each microservice has an environment to work with uh, all the other microservices to check by how much the, the web tracks can be in the web stages? Well, because you, you have to test. If you test against the same environments, you, you, you take the risks in order to test. Uh, avoid another inner service to affect your uh, your service. So yeah, exactly. Problem. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, this is this is a this is a difficult problem to solve. Uh, what we do is basically we deploy all the services at the same time. So whenever and all the whenever we commit stuff, uh, and if it's across and if it's across services. We split the commits, but the commits are done at the same time. So they will be picked up by the build server at the same time, basically. Yeah, so it, it, it will... If you have the commits that are unrelated, but affect each other, it still causes, a, it still might cause a problem. Yeah, but yeah, when that happens, this is good because that, that we will pick that up on the, on the build server. So if it's unrelated, at some point, at some point, the, all the tests will run against it. And if the versions... <coughs> Uh, are, are not coincident because when one commit breaks something something else on another on another service, then you will pick that up on the build server, either or on the exploratory test. At some point, you will you will see that whatever you just the, the versions of all the services that you're going to be, the, they are going to deploy, there is a bug in one of them, and so you basically find out, yeah, okay, is this is this a problem really? Because another commit is just coming down the pipeline that fixes it. Then we don't do anything about it. But if not, then we have to fix it, push, and then see see all the process again. Can I have a question? Can I? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned that you guys are using microservice, so your application needs builds with a lot of service, a lot. Of, 
more? Yeah, it, they are not a lot, but uh, there are some, yes. Oh, okay, when you do the testing, uh, automatic testing, you are testing each service in isolation, or you test this service connecting to the other one? Yeah, we test both. So basically, the first uh, the first pipeline of, of, of uh, tests run against the, the single service, and then we have a, uh, another pipeline of tests that run across the services. Yeah. So yeah. we test integrations, all these points, like uh, versions that don't match. And stuff my, like my question, uh, <coughs> I mentioned, as I asked this question because we are doing uh, continuous delivery at Blip, but we have a lot of problems because we are testing the site, but the site depends on 20 service and if one is down, the pipeline doesn't go straight away to the end and it's not green. Do you have the same problem? Um, uh, you mean like, like when, when one is down, it fails straight away? or yeah, it, When the service is down, the pipeline don't get uh, uh, green in, until uh, the because end. Because it's so. redeploying? Or? No, no, because they are using the, the, the service on the back end. It's like you have a site that has um, behind that site a microservice architecture yes. and the site depends on 20 services and if one is down, the pipeline don't get green yeah, because it's using that service. Yeah, of course. They, they you have the same problem? Well, you, we don't have problems with services being down, but yeah, if, if they don't start because they crash, then yeah, you want to be notified that something's wrong. So I'm not sure if I'm not sure if I understand your question because so when when we when we try test across all the services, we have to bring all the services up. Uh, you bring the service up. Yeah, because we because we, we use the cloud okay. and we just start all the services at one point. All the services are up, and then and then we start we we do the uh, okay. test. Okay, we don't have that because the services are running. We have different uh -huh. pipeline for each service. Okay, I see. Maybe we need to move to that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's a good More question. No. Thank you.